Welcome to Power of Ten, a show about design operating at many levels of Zoom, from thoughtful detail through to transformation in organizations, society, and the world. My name is Andy Pallain. I'm a design leadership coach, service design innovation consultant, educator, and writer. My apologies for the late start. We had both some tech problems, and also the city have decided to cut down a tree just outside of my window. So I will be kind of hitting mute judiciously throughout uh, the interview to try and hope that you're not going to hear that. There it is. So while every app is rushing to add an AI assistant and um, uh, and kind of add AI this and and everything will help you write your you know on LinkedIn you can go online and start to write a post and AI is like you know would you like to me to write your thought leadership for you? My guest today, Oliver Reichenstein, says, "Why should I bother reading what you haven't written?" Oliver is the founder of Information Architects, at the company behind the very popular Markdown-based writing app, IA Writer and more recently, IA Presenter. Uh, He's here to talk about keeping it real when writing with AI and uh, why and how they built in this authorship mode into IA Writer. Oliver, welcome to Power of Ten. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. So it's been an age since we actually kind of chatted person to person. I I can't remember, we we met many years ago um, at a conference and hung out. our two families hung out together. And obviously, I've seen IA Writer um, evolve over the years. One of the first apps that I used on the mobile space, actually, I think is probably where I first started using it as as kind of the iPhone came out and plain text uh, was a thing and and Markdown was a thing before you could kind of really do anything more interesting. So first of all, before we sort of get into the, the latest bit, how has it evolved over the years for you and how many years has it been? It's been 13 years now. Um, the idea is very, very old. I, uh, I used to earn my money as a, as a teacher of uh, Microsoft products, Microsoft Office, and, and in particular, Microsoft Word, where my, my job was to teach people how to use Word, in particular to write um, uh, scientific papers you know, for university or for, 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 for high-level schools. Um, and I used to teach at Art School Basel. And I noticed there that the art school pupils had a similar problem as I had, where instead of writing, they were just, you know, choosing fonts and colors and line heights. And, <laughs> and you know, by the time they were done with the right layout, the, the lesson was over. Um, and of course, that was bothering me as a teacher. But I noticed that I had a similar pattern. Like every time I open Word, I first have to make sure that everything is, is correct before I get started. And um, so at the time, I, I started using a typewriter um, myself uh, to see, you know, how that compares to Word. And I found that I write much better with a typewriter, even though it's very bothersome when you make a mistake and all that. But I found the way it slows you down, mm. the fact that it hurts when you type, that you think twice before just typing anything because you can correct it later, actually led to a much better writing just simply because I was thinking before moving my fingers. And um, um, yeah, and, and, and so that idea was born in the 90s somewhere, middle, mid 90s, but I always carried it with me. And by the end of the, the, the zero years or the noughties, maybe I, I think they're called in English, I'm not quite sure. They do, we say the noughties, yeah. You know, it sounds nasty, but yeah. Because, yeah. well, you know, it's, it's the English people. It's funny, Sandra, right? you know, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, by the end of, of, yeah, around 07, 06, 07, we started to make concepts of, um, of an electronic device uh, that we wanted to build in China uh, by ourselves. So it was half serious to serious, but it started to work with, uh, with a Finnish designer that used to work for NASA, the, the toilets, um, yeah. fits, fits the toilets. Okay. They do toilets for spaceships because Americans didn't okay. like making toilets. It's dirty. So <laughs> they got the Finnish guy that had no experience with anything space. But but yeah, he's, he's a funny guy. He lived in, in Japan. And, and we worked together on a concept for an electronic device, an actual device where you could only write. Um, and then the iPad came out and things went uh, happened very quickly. We were lucky to get one of those iPads early on because we were working for Süddeutsche Zeitung and um, and and Die Zeit and you know the, the moment where where Steve Jobs presented uh, the iPad you know we were on on the job so we were prepared with the, the design um, conditions of the iPad at first we printed out. Uh, 
paper iPads and, you know, uh, moved little boxes and pieces of paper on top of it. And then when I think in May we got the first iPad at the office, uh, you know, we had a little head start because uh, mm. I think it came out. I don't remember exactly when it came out, but uh, we were really, the timing was perfect for our app. And uh, yeah, we had a couple of good ideas from, from the very start. I think we came out with, uh, um, with focus mode, uh, the idea of focusing on one sentence at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, like a typewriter, right? Like a typewriter, exactly. That's what, it was very, it was really a translation of the typewriter, what we've done. Yeah. Um, but we also said it's, it's silly to just force people to write like on a typewriter where you can't edit because that's, that wouldn't be medium appropriate. So yeah. it's a basic design principle that we follow in everything. We look at what does that, what we do now mean in the physical world and how does it translate? How can we improve? Uh, it had reading time and, you know, we, we spend a lot, a lot of time on the, on the typography of it. As, as we always do. And, um, and, and we started thinking about something called reading typography, where we discern the writing from the reading typography. I think it's a, a new thing on computers because before you didn't have much choice on a typewriter, what kind of typography you use. Yeah. And we found that actually monospaced fonts uh, had a lot of benefits. I'm not going to get into each and every point there. But that's where we started. And the, the vision was always the same, to create a writing app that is made for writing yeah. because Word is not like that. Word is the default writing app, but it's more like of a layout thing, but you can do this and that and versioning and all kinds of stuff. It has a visual basic editor in there. I know each and every corner of the, of the, of the nineties, uh, uh, word application, because I taught that and I know each and every bug from the nineties, the latest versions may be fantastic, but from what I hear, um, there's still the same box around, like, you know, that you can't get out of lists, especially if you have a nested list. Once you're in a nested list, you can get out of all these things. It, it's, it, hugely, still present, it, right? it's hugely buggy. I mean, I, I rant about Microsoft kind of on a regular basis. I mean, mostly about their irritating kind of uh, account authentication. But um, yeah, no, I mean, having been working in a, in a consultant, well, it's two, two, two use cases that, that still kind of just irritate me enormously. One is, you know, having worked, having written a book, you know, there comes a point where, because copy editors want track changes, which we're going to get to, um, you know, then we, then you're stuck. Then you, however you've been writing, and I write in Markdown, and I have done for many, many years, pretty much as soon as the spec came out, then you have to go into Word or you, know, you can kind of do it in Google too, but it, it, it's, it's horrible, it's horrific. And I, I, I kind of hate it. I, I, when I wrote my PhD, I avoided using, I used another app called Melel. Uh, back then, because I just I couldn't face uh, doing a long long form. It's really bad for long form writing. Where it just starts chugging really well. It feels like I always feel like it's I'm using an emulator, which I kind of suspect I am. Right. And um, and the other thing is then in um, consulting, obviously, is the world of PowerPoint. Right? And talk about a the the number one place where you can faff about and lose enormous amounts of time on formatting. That's the place. Now, you guys, before we get back into IA Writer, we should probably just talk about IA Presenter a little bit. So um, tell us about IA Presenter. So, yeah, I've, I haven't worked uh, at PricewaterhouseCoopers or wherever you've been. Um, All right, well, it was Fjord, right? So, and Fjord, that was part, right, yeah. Fjord. That was part Fjord used of to be an extension. design agency, but the extension. Oh, well, that's, yeah, that's exactly. such a burn, but yeah, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about like the insider jokes in, the, in those um, I know, that's, the that's consultancies, a... uh, but uh, yeah, I, you know, as a design agency, you're also, you're also you live in PowerPoint. Uh, I used to work yeah, yeah. in Interbrand, yeah. which is yeah. not that yeah. far away from yeah. From the really bad, evil uh, consultancies, but uh, <laughs> Fjord, Fjord, a nice guy, but yes, very but, nice. No, they're yes. very nice. Yeah, they just yeah. yeah, they just belong to McKinsey or what was that again? No, they belong to Accenture. <laughs> I know. Uh, Accenture, which I would, <laughs> you know, I probably would. Yeah, I have to stop. Not, uh, you know, not not the worst. I I would say. I think McKinsey are probably, you know. Yeah, yeah, up there. So anyway, so I yeah, have to start with, with, the, with the evil jokes. But yeah, so what is it? What is it about? You live yeah, yeah. also in PowerPoint, and especially if you work for a bigger consultancy. Yeah. Uh, you uh, you just make one PowerPoint after the other, and yeah. uh, that's that's pretty much what I did at, at Interbrand. I I just lived in PowerPoint. I mm. uh, yeah felt like a very 
very basic camping actually and um, then you know the, there was a phase where every web designer had to be at the design conference and uh, and I followed the tribe and so I was giving one presentation after the other until the, there was a point where I asked myself um, do I really need do I really need to use PowerPoint here as well do I really need to have a presentation and I started experimenting with presentations without PowerPoint and I yeah. like that a lot. And I remember, you know, on weddings or Christmases when, you know, the, your talented uncle stands up and, you know, hits the glass and then starts talking. People paid a lot of attention. Everybody was happy and looking forward to these. And most of these conferences, I'm sorry, but most people don't really enjoy these presentations. <laughs> They, they don't, they're just boring and, and, you know, they have the memes and they have the videos and so on, but there are very few people that really care about what they say. And, um, yeah, I kind of ended my whole career at conferences, you know, because the family was starting to complain, you fly to Australia, you fly here, you fly there, yeah. but actually you have two kids at home and start to say no. And staying with the family, and um, but I, I ended that career more or less by sticking to non PowerPoint presentations and, and just talking. Uh, even though I was talking about, about design, I always have this like tendency to philosophize about design, which is the reason why I, I accepted also these conferences because that gave me the opportunity to talk about uh, Heidegger and, and mm. Plato and Aristotle, which clients uh, at the time were not so eager to hear about and um so but but yeah that that was pretty much it and uh you know i've been mostly working on the application for the last 10 years except for some select clients that i i still work with um and i didn't need much powerpoint anymore and then one of of uh, our employees started working on the markdown version of uh, of powerpoint um quite some time ago and uh, it's a developer very very talented extremely talented extremely efficient uh, um, interesting personality and uh, I was very skeptical it was like first of all I don't like presentations and then just you know making PowerPoint in, in markdowns kind of pointless and I hate that I hate presentation apps yeah Vic viciously and then you know he did, his presentation I didn't you know, wasn't a big commercial success. And he said, like, yeah, but I build it. I have all this stuff. And maybe, you know, I think what's, what is what is needed is some design. And he felt like making it look nice, right? And I don't take that personally. Um, uh, but, oh, what, can uh, you, could you add, can you put some nice, make, you know, design sprinkle on top of my code? Is that what you're... A bit, yeah, a bit, <laughs> a bit. But like I said, he's a, he's, a, he's a really cool guy. He totally understands um, what we are actually doing, but he sort of, I think he might have, no, I'm, I'm being unfair. He knows, he knows what we're doing and he knows that it would have probably gone a bit further, but we planned like three months to see what can happen if we add some design. And then these three months turn into three years because design is not on top it starts on the bottom mm -hmm. so we started asking what is really a presentation how should it be done and you know we started researching we went to to Cicero I don't know how to say Cicero in English that's just something I always read in English Cicero Cic I, I think Cic Cicero I say Cicero yeah. Cicero yeah. Uh, maybe maybe even native speakers don't know how to say Cicero because it's they always to, read it yeah. and anyway so Cicero uh, and, and all, you know, the, the traditional, uh, you know, rhetoric theory. And, uh, and we found some very nice, uh, very useful tips like, you know, the, the, the five, the canon of rhetorics where you start with the idea and then you work on the structure and then you elaborate your speech and then you add detail. You try to remember it, and in the end, actio is not all important. That you actually, you know, you 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 do a good speech, right? This is yeah, something yeah. you need to train and you need to focus, and and all of this is completely left out in PowerPoint. You just focus on you know moving boxes around all the time, and yeah. so I started, started getting excited about it and getting so excited that we worked on this for three years. 
until we have the structure where we say, okay, so our presentation, you start with the idea. If you have nothing to say, maybe you shouldn't do anything. You start with the idea, you write your speech. Then you add visuals where it makes sense, not because you have a slide where you yeah. need to have something. And, and your speech will not be something that everybody needs to see that you put on every slide uh, so you don't forget when you present but it's something that only you see. So it's split between what you say and what you show is a, is a fundamental part of it. And the fundamental part of it is also that you don't use stock imagery and stuff. So we actually have, um, we have some, some secret functionality that we don't show. So we have, um, we have uh, Unsplash actually built into uh, yeah. present, but we never unlocked it because we feel like, hmm, if it would be detrimental to the idea. So we have a sort of like a, I would say like a Protestant, a, pro, a Protestant uh, tendency in our company where we don't do things that would be possible. We also have hidden in the code, we have um, graphics, uh, how do you say, uh, charts and graphics and so on that you could yeah. write. But oh, we, okay. we haven't un unlocked it because it's not good enough. Uh, like we oh. have back backlinks in IA Writer, but we haven't unlocked it because it's as good as everything else and we want to unlock it when it's better. So we've had that for nine months now in IA Writer. We've had backlinks, but we don't we don't unlock it because it's messy. It's, it's, it's nasty. And it's as good as as other apps, but we, we feel like it's below the level of what we have, right? Mm -hmm. So that Protestant thing of, you know, we keep it back, we could do it, but we don't because, not to make other people suffer like the Protestants, that's the Protestants idea, right? They, yeah. You always have to suffer a little bit, otherwise you don't go to heaven. That's not the idea, no, but we are, okay. we kind of like, yeah, sometimes a bit frost, frosty, with, yeah. with with new features and but I think it's good. So yeah. to, to make sure that we keep the original vision and that brings you back to IA right? You know, the vision is always that to make a tool where that is made for writing and that means that where you enjoy writing as well. Yeah. And yeah. and, and I, I noticed lately that means where you enjoy thinking, which is almost a paradox because thinking is very painful. Yeah. I um, I want to get onto that. I'm gonna get onto this just one second. I have got a question here from uh, Nicole. Hi Nicole. Um, and she asked whether it uses re, uh, Reveal JS under the hood uh, of IA Presenter. When it comes to technical matters, I'm, I'm very, I, I think you're not, yes. You're not yeah. I th I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah. I think I heard Reveal before. I leave that to the developers and, and I'm, I'm, I'm like 99% sure. But sometimes I say things technically and they tell me, no, it's, but I'm pretty sure it's Reveal, 99%. All right, yeah. all right. All right. So yeah, just to kind of finish off that, I think one of the things that I, you know, we used to try and, I guess, I don't know when I learned this, but it's the idea that the the deck is not the presentation. And I think this is a thing in consulting that gets, um, you know, uh, conflated all the time. Uh, and, and for a lot of people when they're presenting, and it's partly because, um, you know, you start, you start with the deck and, you know, usually in consulting, you don't start with an empty deck. You go, oh, here's all this kind of other stuff that we really have. And you, you make a Franken deck uh, out of all those different decks. And then, you know, and then you're kind of stuck uh, with all that. Yeah. So let's move on to IA Writer. Yeah. I, I want to touch on the kind of thinking thing, actually. There's a, a designer called John Morica, who's um, uh, one of Tomato. He's, um, you know, very, very long experienced designer. And we often... He often said to me, you know, I, I, he missed the times when Photoshop was, was well, machines were slower, and you know, you'd, you'd apply a fil you know, blur filter in Photoshop and go off and make a cup of coffee whilst it was doing it, you know, chugging away the kind of blue barring, because it, you know, gave me time to think about what I wanted to do next. And so there is this, though, there is this kind of connection between uh, writing and thinking. Uh, you know, one of the things I learned as a writer was, you know, keep the structural stuff of, you know, and that's also formatting, but also keep the structural stuff of like the outline and what you're planning to do and, and editing separate from the actual act of writing, the generative thing. Because when you combine those together, and this is always my message to my students writing their thesis, you know, it's often the first big bit of writing they've done. If you do the editing and writing at the same time, you get caught in that thing where you spend two hours writing the first sentence. Right? And, you, and I used to write a, a column for a design magazine and have to kind of knock out a thousand words every month. 
and you know, and I always knew the first two or three paragraphs. They were they were just I had to let myself write junk because I knew I'd go back because halfway through or towards the end, I would realize, oh, oh yeah, now I know what I'm talking about. And actually, a journalist friend of me said gave me a tip once: so take the last paragraph you wrote, and cut it, and paste it at the beginning, and and because at that point you know actually what you're going to write about, and that's the introduction. So I think there is a kind of parallel there between this idea of kind of uh, thinking and writing. And I know there will be a bunch of people who are watching this um, who are from the, the sort of PKM, personal knowledge management community, who, who use Obsidian. Uh, and for me, I use both, right? And I'm, the way I think about it is I use Obsidian for note-taking and for kind of for thinking and the outlining. And I, I use IA Writer to do the writing. If I want to do some writing, I, I'll use that. And, and that's, for me, the kind of combination of those two. One of the things that does also start to happen, though, is you kind of, as I was saying before, you sort of write to think, right? So, yes, you'll think about what you want to write, but there's a load of stuff that happens as you're writing where you start to realize, oh, you know, and then, and then that, and oh, this is what I actually mean, and so forth. Which kind of brings us to the whole AI assistant thing, right? Which is obviously part of the way you can use that is just to do the writing for you. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I read a thesis the other day that was mostly chat GPT, hard to say. Or you can kind of use it differently. So you, let's, let's go there because, you, you know, as you've built this into IA Writer, God, the AI and AI, IA thing is really annoying, isn't it? Um, yeah. you've, <laughs> you must be so annoyed by that. Um, you've, you've kind of thought about this beyond just, oh, we're going to add this feature or we're going to add this stuff. So maybe we can talk about you and your sort of what you've been thinking about in terms of writing with AI. And you, you've, you wrote this, well, you wrote several pieces actually about, you know, what is it good for and, 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 and when is it useful and when is it not? I mean, uh, this, this whole notion that uh, writing is thinking, um, this is just not, not my thought at all. I, uh, mm. this, this, this is, this is why wildly and widely shared in, in, in writing guides. Uh, like, yeah, I I, William, yeah. William Zinser said it just exactly like that. Writing is thinking, but I've, I've, I've read that in various versions. I, I really love to read books about writing Yeah, yeah me and, too. and, 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 you know, they are written under the condition that they have to show that they know what they're talking about. And, uh, and I, and that pressure often, often leads to good examples. Um, you know, I think some of the best the best writing from from Stephen King is is about writing. Actually, not even mm, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's even it's, called like that. The book, uh, it's it's a great book. Yeah, yeah. his thing was the um, that writing is an act of telepathy, right? That's my favorite line from. That's that great too. Yeah, that's about. true. Yeah, 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 but there are also various versions of this formulation, right? Mm. It's, uh, writing is time traveling and so on. Yeah, um, but. Uh, yeah, when um, when uh, ChatGPT came out a, a year ago, I, I was taken by surprise how well it simulates uh, human language at this point, right? And um, and the big shock for me was not so much that you know this the, the, this, 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 this that, that statistical approach actually works and simulates human thought to the point where you often are not sure is it. On even understanding mm. what it does because it can't without the body I'm philosophically convinced you can't understand yeah um, but it, it was shocking how how well it can simulate thinking and there were two big shocks I tried it with some philosophical literature we both studied philosophy that's also something that our our uh, your your readers maybe your, 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 your viewers maybe know, but it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a funny coincidence that we also found out only a bit later um, uh, when, when we talked back in the day. Now, what was shocking is how well it understands complex uh, philosophical texts. So, you know, when you read uh, the critique of the pure reason in German, um, even now after almost 40 years, for me, it's really difficult. I need to fully focus and I'm trained in the matter, but I have to fully focus and I can consume maybe a page per hour or so. <laughs> it gets really complicated. Yeah. But with ChatGPT, I can ask it, what does that mean? How does that relate to, you know, transcendental apperception mm -hmm. or whatever? And, and it gives me pretty good answers. And of course, you're suspicious and often it, it you know, hallucinates, but, uh, 
very often it's spot on and it can help you. So you, you, if you use it as a dialogue partner to read complex texts, but just as you deal with a human dialogue partner, where you're not like, oh yeah, not that must, must be it, but as you know, as, as a dialogue partner where you discuss with the person. I used to, uh, my, my best friend at, uni, at university, uh, Miriana was, was, was my dialogue partner back in the day. And we used to read Heidegger and all these impossible. We used to read, read Hegel, like the worst stuff, and it was fun um, in, in dialogue. Uh, and, and I can use it like that because, as you know, there are a few people, like my wife doesn't want to talk to me about philosophy. She's majorly annoyed by that waste of time. Uh, and, and other friends, you know, I don't know. A few people re really have to... The desire and the the uh, have the the back the background the education and the will to discuss philosophy for many hours. ChatGPT does that, so that was a nice surprise. I can I have someone I can talk about the metaphysics, which is something I've been studying for two years now. Again, uh, with great passion and 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 I love this book now after many many years where I, I used to hate it. And with ChatGPT, I can do this. So that was a positive surprise. The negative surprise was that the bullshit you get from ChatGPT is very similar to the bullshit you get from corporations and from marketing talk and from management consultancies. <laughs> um, it's 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 almost indiscernible. And and I realized that. I realize that we are all less original than we think we are because when we use language, we often lose, use cliches and things we heard somewhere and we forgot that we heard it and we repeat it and we think, you know, we came up with it ourselves. We also work a lot like ChatGPT. Language yeah. works like that. However, there's one major difference. If you're really serious about, about communicating with other people, what you want to do is you want to transfer the impression you have inside yourself, find an expression that matches that impression as much as possible so that other people on the other side can pick up that expression and make an impression and, 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 and incorporate it actually into an impression inside themselves. I think this is what's really happening when we communicate. We have something inside, something more or less vague, we call it feeling, and we try to find a shape for it, which usually is a form of language, can be visual, can be verbal, can be music, can be, you know, we, when we say language, we often all just think about verbal language. But, mm. but this is what happens when we speak and we mean what we say. We try to, 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 to find a shape for what we sense, for what we, for what we feel, for what we empfind, I would have almost said. And... And, and put that into a shape so other people can have the same impression. That's, and actually dealing with ChatGPT, you know, I started thinking about this in a very, very intense way together with ChatGPT. Uh, I think my first, my first longer conversation was with it was if it can understand. And at first it said it can. And I almost convinced it that it can't understand because it doesn't have a body. And I tremendously enjoyed that conversation which was slightly annoying because I didn't expect that to happen. Um, but it made me think because I thought that this is very, very helpful in many ways for writing. It's helpful for preparation. Yeah. It's helpful for testing what you want to say. And then, you know, for me as a non-native speaker, it's often very, very difficult to write English and not make mistakes that I just can't see. I can't spot them, a comma's missing, something is misspelled, and then people read this, and I feel like people think I'm very stupid, but I just can't see it. And ChatGPT can always spot these mistakes. So there are many things mm -hmm. where it's really great. And But I, you know, all the downsides were very obvious to me, like from the very start, it's going to, in fact, most people are going to use it like business consultants and just splattered the bullshit all over the place and and uh, you, you said you just read a paper that was very likely written with chat GPT. We develop a sense for it like we develop a sense for for you know the visual AI when I see, when I see this lollipop stuff I, I'm not I'm not impressed at all anymore and we yeah. start seeing it with language too but it's much much harder because our senses for, lang 
for language are not as sharpened as our senses are for, for visual products, where now most people, I think, that have a little bit of training in, in, in visual perception will see 99% of, of, of AI-produced imagery and will be able to recognize that. Um, yeah, I talked about it when we were talking earlier, where there's the, you know, people know the uncanny valley, this idea that, you know, a, a 3D rendering, or a, it comes from robotics actually, but, you know, something that's, either the closer it gets to being human, uh, it goes through that valley of like the more it's a little bit off and a bit creepy and uncanny, right? You know, yeah, actually something yeah. that's more abstract, like an emoji or whatever, or, um, you know, is feels more, uh, we're more empathetic to than, than again, it has to be really super exactly human for us to kind of go back through that valley. And I'm sort of getting that quite a lot with uh, AI imagery, but also with chat GPT, there's just, I'm, I'm kind of reading stuff and I'm, I think at least, so this is the challenge, right? And I will get to um, authorship mode is I think I'm reading it and I think I'm, I'm thinking this, you know, there's a shift in tone here and it, it kind of feels like these, this has not been written by the same person. And my suspicion is chat GPT. And obviously when I then put in a prompt around the kind of subject matter that I'm reading and I get kind of the same text back and like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of 90% sure. I do worry that I'm probably missing quite a lot else. So you've built this idea of, you've built this, this functionality into um, IA Writer 7 called authorship. So tell us a bit about how that works and the kind of thinking behind it. I'm going to put the, the, the video up on screen whilst you're talking about it too. Yeah, so... You know, this, this initial perception of how well it can imitate us and what it could lead to in a positive and in a negative way, you know, it strengthened more and more the idea that it's good to use ChatGPT as a dialogue partner when you don't have a human being you can talk to about things and not everybody has an editor um, to work on their, on their texts um, and not everybody has uh, 20... Uh, um, philosophy friends they can talk about critique of the pure reason if they want to read them read it outside of university um, I think it's a very positive use case but you know the ability to pretend that you think to pretend that you've written to pretend that you understand is huge and this will this will be the, the standard use case a yeah. lot of voices started popping up about, yeah, we need to have some sort of watermarking, some fantasies that, you know, there, there will be AI to recognize AI. It's such a ridiculous idea. Technically, I mean, you don't need to think very hard. You know, this is just an arms race that will never be won by anyone. Um, we thought that this, is, this, this, this sounds awfully familiar, this, this problem about, you know, originality and is it really you and so on. And it led back to a long, long internal discussion we had about copyright. Copyright, right? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's, 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 it's a huge, complex, delicate, difficult, dangerous topic to talk about because you're you're very in, you're in proximity to big corporations that use copyright and patent laws to just you know exercise power. Yeah. Um, but it's also very, very real. If you're, especially if you're, um, if you're a graphic designer or indie developer, and you see your stuff being used by these bigger corporations, often that then claim copyright over it, it's it's a huge problem, and it's 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 practically impossible to solve because whenever you say something, you call someone else, you sound like a whiny little shit animal. Oh, 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 you were on YouTube. Can't say that, but there we go. Done it now. Whiny little animal, uh, you know, of the canine kind, uh, and uh, and um, and it's, there's just no way to deal with this. Like just from this from this perspective, and we usually just avoid it. Um, but as a designer, you also know that sometimes you've stolen stuff, right? And sometimes you know that you've done things that you shouldn't have done. And uh, I've, I've done things I shouldn't have done plenty in my life mm. as a designer and as a human being. And I've stolen designs that I shouldn't have. And I, 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 I vividly remember these especially one case where I really shouldn't have done two cases, actually, but I really shouldn't have done it. And I still feel very bad about it, like extremely bad to a point where 
you know, the two people that I, I've stolen from, they probably be like, yeah, it's a long time ago and it's, you corrected it and it's fine. Um, one time I've been called out about this and uh, I corrected it right away and it was so embarrassing because I knew I stole content from another website. Mm. And the guy, you know, he came to me, he's like, you're a young man, you maybe not be fully aware of that, but this is not good, you know? <laughs> and I apologized and took it down. And, and, and the other case is where I stole a design. Um, and I really like, I ripped it off like one-to-one -one because it was so great. It must have been like 2006 or something. I'm not going to say <laughs> exactly, but it was terrible. It was just absolutely horrific. And that stayed with me. I was like, yeah, the, you know, the, the, the person you steal from kind of knows, kind of knows. It's not like a headache where only the person that has the headache knows. The, the person knows as well. Um, but you really know. And you know you shouldn't do it. So we were like, yeah. you know what? This is the right approach for copyright. It's, it's about the author. It's not yeah. about just about the person you steal from. It's a bad thing, sure. And the person will get offended because you steal their time. Because to, to design or to write something, to find a shape, takes so much time. It takes no time to copy stuff, especially in the digital realm. And uh, so we were like, this is somewhat what connected. What if the right approach for AI also is not about, you know, policing and patrolling um, and, and trying to catch people that are using AI like, you know, you were kind of like aiming at before. It's, it's about them. And maybe, you know, if they're not just complete assholes, they feel worse. They feel even worse. Mm -hmm. it's, a it's a very embarrassing thing to steal from other people and being called and being called out and so on. But, but it's not about being called out. You feel bad to begin with. If you're an honest designer, if you're an honest person, you know, when you bullshit people and we do that inadvertently sometimes, but when you say what you don't understand, when you say what you don't mean, mm -hmm. if there's any humanity left in you, you feel really bad about it. And I thought, Maybe this is the right angle that we do not that we do not try to create like something that scans for chat GPT typical expressions because we have. They don't work very well anyway. You know, it I've, wouldn't work really well. I've but tried them and I, everything I put through it went hundred percent human. I was like, you, you know, this is just I've just taken this generated from chat GPT and it doesn't work. You, you could go down this path, but you know, whenever you do something like that, you could, there's always a countermeasure as well. But it's 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 ethically the wrong part. The, the, yeah. the wrong approach. Ethically, the right approach is saying, like, you have to decide for yourself. And, you know, you can use ChatGPT for, spell, for, for spelling, for grammar. <laughs> Here we go again. <laughs> there you go. For, for, spelling, for, for spelling, for grammar. I think, you know, editing is fine. You know, uh, journalists have editors and they change a lot of text. Yeah. I think it's yeah. fine. Um, um, you know, uh, you, you don't need to have the, you know, academic levels of scrutiny where you're not allowed to actually just, you know, trans, transcribe a thought, but in the end, it's up to you. And as an author, you know, and so we wanted to build something like that. And we said, the main problem we have currently is that if you're an honest person, but you use ChatGPT to write in the most honest way you can, you don't want to pretend to say what you don't understand or express what you don't mean. You don't have a possibility to discern what you got from ChatGPT and what you did yourself. And then we had the technical problem. How the hell do you do this in Markdown? And now we have a solution where people are like, yeah, it's, some people say like, oh, it's just marking off, it's no big deal. It's, 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 it was super hard to do. And, um, and now, yeah, now it's kind of obvious. Um, so then, you know, the, the circle closed where we were like, holy shit, now we have that copyright problem again. Because people are going to copy it. And, you know, our friends at Obsidian, they've been just ripping off our design, like up and down, just like to the pixel, They how to reconstruct I writer and an electron. I, we like the team at Obsidian, and Obsidian is great software. It does fantastic, um, impossible things. So my favorite function is how you can lay out stuff like in Illustrator. And stuff. This is all good. But, you know, ripping off our design, it pisses me the fuck <laughs> off, you know, because it's not cool. It's cool if you do it for yourself, but it's not cool if you put like entire libraries out there, like how to, 
You know, it's, yeah. it's really yeah. not cool. To, to be fair to the Obsidian team, though, it's not it's not them, right? It, it, it's it, it's the plugin and the kind of theme. Oh yeah, um, you know, I, I I've talked to to Kepano about this when he started lauding yeah. someone, you know, for for being so innovative to invent syntax highlight. I was like, dude, this is not innovative. It's just another ripoff. And he was like, yeah, I'm sorry, it's true. You know, we know. He knows the feeling because he, he's also a developer and he gets ripped off all the time. Um, but it's also not an attitude, honestly, to say like, well, it's not our fault. We want to be flexible. We can Actually, I think, and I'll have to talk to them again about this. Uh, I, I meant to do that. I think they should tell their developers, hey, please don't. Don't make clones of other indie apps, right? If you make a clone of Word, you know, you can punch up like this. But the clones of other indie apps, it's like, and and you know because we don't punch punch down or or on the same level, but you know Obsidian with being a free app has a pretty big mm. audience at, at this point. I don't think it's punching down anymore. When I say yeah. like, yes, you know, have a policy for you know what's cool to clone and whatnot. If it's if it's pixel perfect cloning, like it's just not cool. It's it's not cool. And we haven't said anything about it until it, until the show. But I think yeah. it's just fucking uncool. This stuff. It pisses me off. And it's also a bad clone of them because what we do, you can't. It's not a native app. And, and you know, the, the, the degree we go to with our typography is insane. But I'm yeah. not going to get into details. Well, I, I was just going to say, I, I think there's maybe a fair counter argument to this. I'd be interested to see what your response is because, yeah. um, you know, I have seen people say, well, you know, I like this bit, but I don't like all the rest. And I don't want to be, because I think it's probably fair to say, and I think you were kind of one of the sort of early. Um, I mean, you said it at the beginning, but also sort of one of the early voices in the, of the idea of kind of opinionated app design, right? Where, you know, IA writer has, there's opinion in there, right? There is, there's a lot of yeah. detailed thought and uh, des- design philosophy that goes into it. And, um, and it's not going to be for everyone, right? Uh, and right down to, you know, whether you show the markdown or whether you don't and all that kind of stuff. These are decisions I know you've thought long and hard about. I don't think they're, they're not, you know, random. But uh, I was thinking of the German word "willkürlich," and I can't think what the English word of that is. I think um, <laughs> and um, but at the same time, you know, people might go, "Well, you know, I really kind of like the focus mode, but I, I kind of don't really want all the rest." Uh, or you know, the other stuff, the way you you handle the kind of markup is not for me, or whatever. Do you think that it's fair then, or are you going? To, would your answer be, "Well, yeah, sure, do it for yourself then. R- write a kind of little CSS snippet." For yourself to enable that, but is your is your point really? It's not that. It's actually the whole constellation of sort of put, trying to kind of customize and use a whole bunch of plugins and and CSS to try and sort of completely clone the exact look and feel within an. I have I have absolutely no problem whatsoever. You can do, you know, you can you can clone anything you want for yourself. If you do it for yourself privately, I, I do that all the time. You learn a lot; it's great, and and maybe yeah, you you know this this a particular person is like, oh, you know the bold needs to be gray. We have, like you say, we have a good reason why we don't do that, and um, and we just say no. We, we thought about this long and hard, and typography is kind of something. Yeah, you know, we're we're very opinionated in a way, but we also know what the hell we're doing there, and um, and so yeah, if if that is so important for you, you can replicate that in whatever yeah. app you want. That's that's fine. If you do things for yourself, it's totally fine. Yeah. What I think is absolutely horrendous is to make full packages that allow you, everyone, to clone our apps, you know, functionally, design-wise, down to the pixel, which actually is not possible anyway, yeah. down to the pixel in another free app. This is totally uncool. And, you know, people thinking like, Oh yeah, it will be free advertisement for you or something. Fuck off! No, we don't need free advertisement. We're doing fine. That's not the point. Uh, it's about it's about stealing someone's design and make it available for everyone. It's called counterfeiting. And you know, if you want to, it's illegal. But that's not the point. It pisses us off because it's our work, and you're not supposed to distribute it freely to everyone. Now, yeah. if you if you're not happy with a certain way that we design our app. And you want pretty much everything that we have, except for yeah, like some some like asterisks risks that want to be great. Well, yeah, do what you can, you know, and build rebuild the app in in Xcode if you want the native feeling. Um, you know, tr- 
no, I'm not going to provoke people now with this. No, but, no. Um, it's fine. It's fine. The problem we have is the is the, and we didn't realize that for a long time because, like I said, usually we stay silent, we don't say anything. And actually, yeah. these these plugins are not even that. They're not even that that popular, you know. And they're they're they're, they're being left there and they decay. And it's not it's not a big commercial problem for us. It's not, it just pisses me off because the attitude is the wrong one. Yeah. This is not something you can just take and distribute freely to other people. It's not yours. Do you, you, have, you have bigger problems in the app store though with things like AI writer and, and things using your logo and everything, you know, and just kind of switching the letters around. Them. It's, it's, not, it's not a commercial the, problem. Look, we, we, we've sold 3 million apps in 13 years. We have 500,000 yeah. users. Everyone has paid our app. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. Like we have made some experiments with like a free tier on Android. It was an absolute disaster. It attracts completely the wrong people for the type of app we have. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, the la- last word on opinionated. I hate that word. And, ah, I thought you might and the problem is the problem is I'm <laughs> I'm not a native speaker, so I don't yeah. I don't have so many contexts for the word opinionated. The only time where I hear opinionated, it's negative. And I know it's been used. No, you get used positively to use positively quite a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. People have been trying to use this in a positive way, but every time people say opinionate, I'm like, no, it's not opinionate. No, I think yeah, what I, have, I have opinions, but but you know, it's not. We don't do that because we think our way is the only right way, and you have to follow because we. Yeah, know. but that's the idea. I mean, when people talk about an opinionated app, what they're saying is, this is my opinion. I mean, the. Um, is it Logsec? I think it's that one, that, uh, which it, you know it takes that view as well. Which is, you know, this is the this is the approach I'm going to take to this. I have opinions about the you know the style or the you know the mental model or the UX or whatever it is about this, and I'm going to sort of apply those to the thing I'm making, which is is fair enough. Right? I'm making a thing, and you have to have an opinion, right? The, the worst way is down the other end. I think we, I mean, we get the sort of design by committee. A lot of enterprise software is like this, where it, or and a lot of open source stuff is like this, actually, where it's kind of opinionless and it's kind of te- generally really watered down or kind of incoherent and inconsistent um, because of this. I think so. You know, for for my view, I think you have to have an uh, opinion about we're going to choose this because an opinion helps you make a choice, right? It's a filter. So we're going to do this instead of this because our underlying uh, philosophy. Is um, you know is is based around that. So that's what I mean by that. But I, I want to get back. I want to get back. I want to get back. I want to get back to this idea of interoperability because um, partly mm. it's in my head because I've been yeah, listening yeah. to and reading uh, uh, Corey Doctor L's the, the Internet Con. You know, and at the heart of it is this idea of of interoperability or of avoiding it. You know, and that's what big tech has done. Has obviously has tried to. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, see yeah, it going yeah. on with the confederated thing at the moment. You know. Um, tried to avoid interoperability, and you know, um, in order to create these huge kind of walled gardens and monopolies. Yeah. Um, and so, one of the things, that, so briefly, I guess, I, one of the things that with that um, authorship mode does in IA Writer is when you're pasting stuff in, you it, it will keep a reference of like what you've what you've pasted and who, and and who the author is of that stuff. Which for me is is great because one of the things that happens, I find when I'm working with other people is we lose track of who wrote what, you know. And as you mentioned in the article, you know, track changes in Word or, or using Diff. I know there's, there's a, a school of working or writing which uses Git um, for writing. It's pretty kind of horrendous, really, in the end, as a kind of user experience. And so you've, you've come up with this uh, approach um, to do this. And so you, and, and in it, you sort of grade out stuff so that gradually you kind of, as you rewrite the AI written stuff or the other author, written stuff it, it kind of turns black um and so you get to the sense of how much is yours and how much is is written by, by someone or something else but you've also released this as um on github as uh, markdown annotations so um given the conversation around you know features and not being ripped off and so forth why why release this as a as a you know open source or as, yeah. a, as a spec so so this was this was a heated debate. This is a heated debate because we, are, we also run a business. We do, right? And, you know, the first thing that happens when we do something new is we get ripped off, like, regularly. And I know how whiny and how, you know, little animals this sounds, but 
it's just, it's a reality. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And you don't know, you have no idea how much it happens because we never say anything, but we see all this mostly yeah. because people report that. I, you know, when, when we came out with IA right, we, we had different mails every day yeah. of people pointing to this and that and the other, and you develop a thick skin, but it's also, it's also annoying. And then from a business pr perspective now, it would have been much cleverer to just keep this for some time until someone copies it or copies something similar and then it's not interoperable anymore. Yeah. Um, but the, the reason why we like Markdown most of all is because of its interoperability. It's fantastic. I copy paste stuff all the time. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand about Markdown because they're like, oh, can you have an export here, an export there? But actually it's about copy and pasting stuff. I copy and paste it from, from I write it to to, um, to to WordPress, to ChatGPT and back, and it's, it always works. Also, ChatGPT uses Markdown, it's fantastic, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is, it's really cool. This interoperability is fantastic. So we were like, okay, so there's the interoperability aspect where we, we can't just ignore this. And rather than people doing something similar, but then it's com not compatible anymore, we should actually publish it. And then there's the other aspect where we say like, well, at authorship, it's up to you. You need to decide. So we said, like, so why don't we formulate it like that? Well, it's not something clear cut like the legal texts. Mm -hmm. And it, like I said, it's not about legality when we talk about co copyright. It's about morality. And it's not, it's not clear cut. You can do this, but not that. And the other thing, because design doesn't work like that. Design, you know, when you copy design, you know it. And the copy person kind of knows it as well. So we said, like, well, let's do it like that. You can use the functionality just as it is. Well, if you can help us developing it, and we got a lot of really great feedback on that as well, and we will develop it based on that feedback, which is fantastic. We didn't expect that because usually when you do so, something open source, you don't get much feedback. Just people just use it, and that's it. You've seen that with the fonts, right? Um, but anyway, I'm not one, I don't want to complain too much. The, 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 what, what we want is people to use this and do their own thing with that. And if they do their own thing, it's fantastic. And it's completely up to them. And that doesn't mean you can abuse it and just say like, well, you serve yourself to me so I can cheat. That's really not the idea. It's the, they have to get into the reality of, 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 the, of the creative business where you need to find a way with yourself to come to peace with how much you copy and how much you don't. And mm -hmm. then you need to live with it. That's, that's our take. And um, we're not going to call out people, um, you know, I'm not saying categorically not calling out people because if you go too far, you go too far. But uh, yeah, we, we reserve the, the freedom to say something if mm -hmm. it's just ridiculous, right? But um, no, very likely we're not uh, going to say anything even though we don't agree. It's up to you. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, though is, if you're not sure, you can always talk to us. And that's also, you know, a reality that few people, that few, that few, that few people grab that when they do something and they're not sure, will this piss off the other person? They talk to you. And yeah. um, I always appreciate that. But I think, you know, to, to sort of end up with that, I'm, I'm really pleased you to have uh, released it because I, I find the interoperability part is the kind of the critical bit of plain text and markdown, right? You know, the, the whole fact yeah, that sure. you can, you know, plain text is very robust. You, uh, there was a little some conversation about it on Mastodon. You know, you can have several several apps open at the same time, accessing the same plain text file. And um, even when they're auto-saving, most of the time, they, they don't clash with each other. And obviously just kind of move from one side to, to the next for whatever you're doing. However, you know, like it's not, it's not very... It's not very realistic that this is going to be a standard or something. Even well, I hope it is. I mean, I really hope a lot of really people hope. are going to use it. I'm, I'm not very hopeful on that. You're not hopeful. No. I, I am. I am. No, it's I, more you know, of I, a, uh, yeah. Well, because the perennial kind of pain for anyone who's writing and having to collaboratively write, and, and like I said, and you've got an editor and stuff, is like at some point having to go back into Word or, or Google for track changes. I know there's critic markup. I, I've had a go. For, for maybe if I was a, a proofreader, a bit like the way proofreaders know all those little symbols, you know, that they used to kind of write on a, on a manuscript by hand. You kind of remember all the markup. I just found it too, too much for me to kind of remember at the time. And I kind of really liked this as, a, as an approach. So 
Uh, I hope it does, because I, I really want the sort of collaborative markdown writing tool that doesn't involve some kind of weird gymnastics going between, you know, putting stuff up onto Google and then and then exporting again. And it, it, no, I've tried it and, and none of it ever works. Even there's a, there's a sort of Etherpad kind of plug-in for Obsidian that sort of attempts that, but it doesn't, it doesn't really work. So, um, you know, that would be, that's the holy grail for me. And so I, I hope that does, I hope it does become a standard. Hey, we're um, we're coming up for time. Um, the where can people find you online? Are you are you basically on IA Net? Yeah, yeah. I, I I moved away completely from from Twitter. Uh, mm. We we have some you know bad bad conscience tweets here and there sometimes because we think like yeah, do you few good people that are still left on Twitter. And there are some good people still left. You know, yeah, this is, by the way, what we did, but we'll, we'll move completely over to saying, uh, you know, subscribe to our newsletter or yeah. come to Mastodon, where I am right now. I think I, I feel very comfortable on Mastodon. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, we are at A at some instance on Mastodon and, and Reichenstein at, at Mastodon. Um, you know, what, what I used to do on Twitter, um, now we do on we yeah. do there. It's great. Yeah. The, the audience is perfect for indie developers and for people yeah. that think alike. Um, still, one more last word about this: about you know whether it becomes a standard or not. I, I've been dragged into that word, you know, being forced to use word again and again uh, mm. myself. I'm not. I'm not naive. I know what the standard defines. It's the most used apps, Google Docs. Mm. After after work, but I think it's 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 really important that we do what we say and that we act accordingly. And so putting this out there, you know, there's of course there's a little hope that you know more people will pick this up and you know we would be able able to use um, also ship in different places. But mostly we have to offer the possibility to do that, and yeah. um, and we have to stay true to what we say about authorship and copyright and, you know, allow people to make their own decisions in that way. And if we said like, no, this is our standard, you can only use it here. It may be profitable um, short term, but it's, it, it, it won't be very useful. What we did instead is we tried as much as possible to look at this back and forth. You know, if you copy yeah. the text in that is different, you can say, where does it come from? And, and we spend a lot of time on that as well. Yeah. But if other people use it and, and evolve evolve it and find another shape of it, maybe even a better one, where we would be tempted to, you know, copy and improve it, because that's what creativity is. You copy and improve to a point where you don't necessarily recognize the original at once, at one mm-hmm. side. Then that would be really, really cool. Mm-hmm. So But it would be nice. I mean one I think one of the, you know, the gifts to the world of John Gruber was to kind of not try and sort of own the Markdown spec, especially as there's been, you know, other variants of it and there's all sorts of different kind of flavors of it now. And, you know, and, and, and he's kind of resisted a lot of pressure to kind of change the, yeah. his kind of original spec. It's like, you know, this is, this is the spec if you're going to go off and do something else and go off and do something else. But, you know, uh, I think he's changed one thing. I can't remember which one it was. I don't know if it's images or, or footnotes. I don't, um, I don't think footnotes are in the original spec. Um, no. And, uh, and it's, it's become this great thing that's kind of everywhere, even in chat GPT. So the, the show, uh, Power of Ten, it's named after the Ray and Charles Eames film. It's called Powers of Ten. And it's, it's about the relative size of things in the universe. And I've always really liked it for that kind of different levels of mental zoom and, and the sort of repeated patterns at different phases. So on that front, the final question is always, what one small thing is either overlooked or could be redesigned that would have an outsized effect on the world? Wow, I uh, you, you I know this matter that I never, you. I, <laughs> I never watched your show, which I should. <laughs> then I would have known this uh, one thing that uh, I think I don't think it's a little thing, but one thing I notice is the trash can. You know, uh-huh. we we separate we separate uh, the trash. We have organic trash and plastic bottles and and cardboard, and we have like a big. We have like a big box now of mm-hmm. different trash elements and we do our best to separate that. And yet, for some reason, whenever I look at my trash can, I feel like, what a bunch of evil people are we? You know, every time I look at my trash can, I'm like, yeah, you're not trying as hard as you can because it's just still too much stuff in there. It still fills up too quickly. And, and I wonder, I don't know how, I don't have a solution, but I wonder if someone could have a look at this and, you know, 
find a way to redesign the trash can in a clever way that it helps us to not fill it up so quickly with all kinds of crap. I, I, you know, my, my brain starts working already on yeah, it. I okay. think about labels. I think about small, making it smaller or whatever, <laughs> but uh, making a smaller opening. I don't, I'm not sure, but I think this would change a lot because we throw, still throw away way too much stuff. I'm looking forward to the IA trash can. <laughs> uh, you've got these beautiful notebooks you just made. We didn't even talk about those. I, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on one of those too. Uh, Oliver, thank you so much for being my guest on Power of Ten. Thank you as well. It was a pleasure. You have been listening to and watching Power of Ten. You can find more about the show at polane.com, P-O-L-A-I-N-E.com, where you can also check out my leadership coaching practice, online courses, as well as sign up for my pretty irregular newsletter, Doctor's Note, although I, I will be doing an end of the year one. Uh, if you have any thoughts, you can put them in the comments below if you're on YouTube. You can find me at apolane, A-P-O-L-A-I-N-E, and on pkm.social on Mastodon. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and watching, and I'll see you next time. Whoa.